check equipment and we're, we're trying to figure out how to put a battery in your microphone. Um, we figured that, <laughs> figured that one out. Um, anyway, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to welcome you and, and, and thank you all for this wonderful turnout. You guys have taken uh, time in the afternoon uh, to augment your education and that's absolutely incredible. It's nice to see everybody here. It's nice to see um, enthusiastic about being here. Um, so, you know, that's the most important thing, right? Because without that kind of enthusiasm, where would we be? Um, I'd also like to point out uh, the lecture series poster um, that you'll start to see in the corridors. It has all the names and dates listed of the lectures that are coming up this semester. But if you happen to forget what, uh, what the lecture is going to be each week, a safe bet would be to show up at a particular time during the week, which would be when? Mondays at what time? Four o'clock. Mondays at four o'clock, and odds are you're going to get a really good lecture. Okay, so all you have to remember is Mondays at four. Keep your eyes open for the posters, and uh, and you'll be able to find out uh, what's going on. Today we're extremely fortunate to have Joe Valerio with us to uh, uh, talk to us about his work and uh, and his involvement in uh, in all the projects that he's been working with. Um, and uh, without any more from me, I'm going to invite. Professor Gray up to say a few words about Joe Valerio and his practice in Chicago. Uh, Professor Gray. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's with uh, great pleasure I uh, uh, welcome uh, Joe Valerio to our school and thank him for coming down. Uh, Joe is uh, principal of Valerio DeWalt in training. Uh, what he calls a mid-sized firm in Chicago, I would call a large firm in Chicago, uh, doing uh, very significant uh, large-scale work all around the world. And uh, uh, the firm, despite uh, its size as it's grown over the years, has uh, managed to maintain a, a real critical edge to the work and to the thinking uh, that, that's a real inspiration to us all. Um, and uh, the firm has managed to remain agile and uh, innovative, as, uh, as they point out on, on their web website under the description of the firm. Um, build or die, uh, if, if you take anything away from uh, the, the, the lecture tonight, remember uh, that, that, web, that uh, uh, phrase, because that is the will website for uh, the firm of uh, 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 Valerio uh, uh, DeWalt and Train, builderdie.com. And uh, there's an impressive array of work on the website. And, and uh, what really impressed me about the website was the description of the firm itself. Uh, uh, if you go uh, to the link entitled Us, which is a description of, of the firm, uh, it uh, begins with a description of the space itself, which uh, uh, to me was very interesting and very telling that uh, uh, the firm would choose to describe uh, who they are and how they work by uh, the physical description of the space that they work, which uh, I've learned from Joe, they actually uh, built themselves. And uh, uh, the firm has its roots in, in uh, a small practice and, and uh, its roots in academia. And uh, they've managed to, to grow and, and do projects of uh, uh, very significant scale, but maintain uh, that sensibility in the work, which, which I think is very impressive. Uh, among uh, Joe's uh, list of uh, 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 awards and credentials and publications, which is really uh, too numerous uh, to, to go into in depth. Uh, I'd like to, to single out one, uh, 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 one particular award that we'd like to thank him for, and that's being a sponsor of GLUE. Joe uh, and his office uh, were one of the primary sponsors of the, the periodical that we have here at school. Uh, really, we, we'd like to thank him for that and thank him for coming down and supporting us. Uh, I'll uh, just briefly touch on uh, 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 some of Joe's background. Uh, Joe received his Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Michigan uh, and went on to get a Master's from UCLA. Uh, he spent uh, uh, some of his uh, early days out of school working with a, an experimental group called EAT, Experiments in Art and Technology, uh, who, among other things, uh, 
uh, did a project for Pepsi-Cola at the uh, uh, Expo 70 in Osaka. Uh, and uh, uh, all of the early work done by EAT was actually uh, designed, built, and fabricated by, by the uh, 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 participants. And I think that's a sensibility uh, that, that informs later work as well. Uh, in 1973, uh, Joe began teaching at University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. Um, he uh, was founder of Chrysalis of Wisconsin, winning uh, first national AIA Oak Honor in 1981, um, and uh, started his own firm in Chicago, Valerio Associates, in 1988. Uh, 1994, uh, Valerio Associates merged and, and became uh, uh, Valerio DeWalt Train Associates, where, where Joe is currently practicing. Uh, Mr. Valerio has served as chair of the National AIA Committee on Design, member of GSA uh, Peer Review Panels, president of Chicago Architectural Club, uh, president of Contemporary Arts Council, and the list goes on and on. Uh, the list of publications, awards, and affiliations is really uh, uh, too lengthy to, to go through right now, but uh, uh, I want to thank Joe for taking time out of his busy schedule to come and talk to us, and uh, uh, hope you can walk off of If anybody else needs a chair, just grab this. Oh. Okay, now we're going to see if we get feedback. Okay, we don't seem to. Um, it's nice to be here and thanks for coming out. I hope I can, over the next hour, I can, uh, I can entertain you and, or at least make the time pass quickly. Um, ah. um, we find inspiration in, in many different places for our work. And years ago, I was in a bookstore and there was a book called, um, film stills, and it was a series of photographs by a woman whose name is Cindy Sherman. And the interesting thing about every one of these images, and every image was an image of a woman in a setting that reminded you of some movie or cin cinematic event. And the interesting thing was every single picture in the book was actually a, a, a picture of Cindy Sherman herself. And I found the pictures to be kind of remarkable in their content and in their, their sort of, uh, their sort of sensibility. And so I bought the book. Um, years later, um, Rizzoli did a monograph on my work and, and Cindy Sherman's film stills book was published by Rizzoli. And I mentioned to the book editor at Rizzoli that I owned a copy of that book. And at that point in time, Cindy Sherman had become very popular as an artist. And he looked at me and he said, you know, I think we only sold two of those to anyone who actually bought them, and the rest we threw away. But anyway, I bought the, I bought the book, and I've always been interested in her work. And Michael Sorkin, in his book, Ex Exquisite Corpse, writes about Miss Sherman's photographs. And I'd like to read a quote. I'm going to read a few quotes today. Not many, but just enough so you'll get a sense of where we're going. Um, so this is from Michael Sorkin. There is an artist called Cindy Sherman who has produced a series of photographs which she calls film stills. Uh, the conceit behind this work is of isolated frames from a movie. Each shot is an evocative, costumed self-portrait in which Sherman dresses as some resonant, fe resonant female image. Sherman appropriates a familiar cinematic context by placing herself in its midst. Importantly, in most of these stills, her eyes are fixed on someone or something out of frame, imposing the idea of a missing narrative. 5017 Ravenswood is a house that we finished a couple years ago in Chicago. The house wears an evocative costume of galvanized sheet metal. The very blankness of this fabric creates a void a void that implies the same missing narrative um, as seen in Sherman's photographs. Uh, is this important? Well, let's find out by examining the work that we've produced over the last four or five years. 
5017 Ravenswood began with a certain physical violence, uh, reducing the building to a ruin of three masonry walls. In your case, you're wondering why we removed those beautiful bowstring trusses, is that the property had been a t-shirt shop and had been uh, uh, where they silk screen t-shirts. And uh, it had been filled with uh, various drywall partitions underneath those trusses. And we got in there and thought that the job was going to be relatively straightforward and we were just going to sort of do a one-story loft. And we soon discovered that all the trusses had failed and they all needed to be replaced. So we proceeded to replace them. The face of the building on Ravenswood appears uh, uh, to view the neighborhood with a certain suspicion. Yet if you watch it closely, the building becomes an animate object, exhibiting a certain vulnerability. Um, the left door opens to reveal the garage, or the center door opens for a pedestrian uh, with a nerve to knock on the metal panels. And finally, the right door opens to share the private garden with the street. So on the right, you have the sacred. On the left, you have the profane and the garage. The garden offers a view of the house defined by a steel frame on a 16-foot grid. Interior and exterior are separated by the thinnest of glass planes. The roof structure is defined uh, by a warped steel grid suspended from the surrounding masonry walls and supported in the center by a series of columns. The plan is all bones and no meat. Uh, uh, but these elements, um, the uh, front face of the building and then the grid of steel, really defines um, uh, a series of elements, or is defined by a series of elements. Uh, they're the walls, the sort of ruined walls in the masonry building. Uh, we then closed that box with a metal face on the street. We suspended the frame, we inset the glass, and then finally we roofed it all over. Um, those elements define three spaces. There's the space of the street, which is bordered on one side by the house and on the other side by a railroad embankment, the space of the garden, and then finally the space of the house. Um, our feeling is that the sort of tension is self-evident in this plan. On the one hand, you have the battered visage of the galvanized facade and the ruined masonry walls standing in stark contrast with the precision of the steel and glass. Um, the second project I'm showing you is the Dahlmeyer residence. Um, this is a project which we are just starting design work on, but I thought the images were interesting, and so I'm presenting them today, actually for the first time. Um, the Dahlmeyer property is in Wadsworth, Illinois, and it's kind of an iconic Midwest landscape uh, composed of a stream, a pond, and gently rolling hills, which um, sort of rise up to define a huge outdoor room. Um, given the sort of ultimate blank canvas, uh, what was the appropriate response? And I guess the answer in our mind was nothing was the appropriate response, but just what is nothing when you think of a building? Um, there's another artist, and I think you can by now recognize that we relate very strongly to the art world. There's an artist named David Brose who has published a monograph of his photographs called Ready Maids. Each of the series of images in this book documents an iconic form as it passes from present technology to dead technology. One of the things he's fascinated with is the outdoor movie screen. And here is one in action. But David Brose recorded them as a series of blank, abandoned forms that grace uh, the American landscape from coast to coast. Um, So here in these blank screens is nothing in the sense of a void in the center of the landscape. And in our minds, that seemed to have the right sensibility for the Dahlmeyer house. But David Brose also photographed a series of other objects, pickup trucks, um, roadside signs, and then railroad cars. And the fascinating thing about the railroad cars that he photographed where quite often there was a door that was, the door would be left ajar. So you had this form that in many ways was blank like the outdoor movie screen, 
So it was a void. But then there was an opening in the center of the railroad car that was really a void. So you had a void within a void. Um, so we were convinced to build a house that was a narrow wall of space. And this is the house sort of looking at it uh, in its end, from its end, end, from the end elevation. But the primary elevation um, is this view. And we envisioned the, 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 uh, the outdoor movie screen temporarily filled with a narrative from some forgotten movie. In its center, we have a picture window where the occupants of the house can participate in the narrative. But this image is more dream than reality. In Norm, um, the house becomes a large blank canvas on the landscape. And at the center of it is a void which opens the interior of the house to views of the surrounding um, landscape. The plan is simple, a large rectangular, of living, rectangular area of living space modulated by two small rectangles, one uh, with a kitchen um, and, and the other with storage and, and bathing functions um, uh, to, the, to the left. The east end of the, of the building uh, pokes into the densely forged portion of the site. while. Uh, to the north, uh, or to the west, uh, the kitchen uh, overlooks uh, the remnants of an old, um, uh, an old orchard. And then to the north, the house borders on a small clearing in the forest that surrounds the site. Um, so 5017 Ravenswood and the Wadsworth, Wadsworth House our bookends wrapped around the notion that in our times, certainly uh, there is an illusion and ambiguity which is both normal and appropriate. In each case, this end is achieved by leaving things out rather than filling them in. This is another one of Cindy Sherman's photographs. This is film still number 10. Here, there's a refrigerator, stove, and two relatively small, uh, which are two relatively small objects but they are able to conjure up an image of an entire household. You can imagine the kitchen, uh, the living room beyond, in this, and in these series of photographs, the unexpected and unknown is expressed in Miss Sherman's eyes, always focused on someone or something which is unseen. Architecture is at its best when it expresses the unknown and unexpected. How can this be done? One way is to juxtapose things in unexpected ways, creating an ambiguous image. Here, the refrigerator, this happens to be my refrigerator when I was a student at UCLA, um, uh, is a very expected appliance. Yet in this case, it serves up a meal of modern media instead of food. Um, we worked for a client in Chicago, uh, Tracy Gardner. In fact, we did an apartment for Tracy in Chicago, which is uh, the images you see on the screen. And then we did a second apartment in New York for him. And um, uh, in both cases, uh, we, uh, we built both apartments or we contracted for both apartments. So these were uh, true labors of love. Um, his Chicago ap apartment juxtaposed what I would consider sacred space um, in the form of two objects, an aluminum box on the lower level of the apartment and a wood box on the upper level against um, what I would call profane space. Uh, this is the upper level box, which was a, a study area. Um, which were the residual spaces which were left around these two objects. Um, so you had two containers that sort, of pr that sort of expanded out in this apartment. And then there was this, these religious residual spaces that were trapped between the walls of the apartment and the sacred containers. These contained all the sort of messy functions, eating, bathing, sleeping, were all contained in these areas. Um, Somehow, um, the New York apartment needed to be unexpected in a different way. 
And this apartment began life as a white drywall box with a nice wood floor. Um, and it was a very different kind of project in the sense that when we built Tracy's first apartment, it took us two years to build that apartment. And um, we needed every minute of the two years. Um, the New York apartment was one of those situations where Tracy went in, put a significant amount of money down on a property that was still uh, in, the, in the Tribeca area and they were still producing garments in his apartment. And we waited and we waited and we waited for the developer to take control of the building and convert the property. And um, finally Tracy came back to me and he said, Joe, you can't have two years to do this apartment. I said, well, how much time can I have? He said, how about one month? I said, okay, we'll see what we can come up, come up with. Um, and so given that period of time, we didn't have the time to put together a, a sort of Swiss watch like we did in Chicago. So instead, we invented a set of appliances, um, which were manufactured in Chicago in their entirety and actually pre-assembled in Chicago to check dimensions in our fabrication techniques, and then were shipped uh, in New York in two large semi-trailers. Uh, um, and these appliances, uh, like the appliances in film still number 10, are expected to tell sort of their own story that in a way masks, uh, the way a costume masks uh, the sort of naked truth of Tracy's apartment, which in truth it was just a white drywall box and still is. So we inserted a series of objects, which you see in this, this ax, ax, axonometric. And as I said, these objects are an elaborate costume. Um, um, they're, a scenery, they're a scenery which supports the critical drama of the apartment. It contributes to a person's suspension of disbelief, an important part of theater. They cover the truth and they offer an exciting fiction. The substrate, um, the original drywall box, carries no message, just as Cindy Sherman's condition is not evident in her self-portrait. But furnishing the apartment with all these new appliances makes it a place uh, that you never expected. Uh, the uniform or the costume transforms the ordinary into the extraordinary. But like all appliances, um, but just like real appliances, many things are hidden in the vegetable drawers. In this case, a real kitchen is hidden um, inside a, uh, the metal enclosure. As a design for um, Gardner, U New York developed, it reinforced the obvious importance of Mrs. Sherman's, Ms. Sherman's elaborate costumes. If she, if, she, if she was naked, there would be no drama. Her dress hid the truth, creating a certain uncertainty, a certain sense of the unknown. And our appliances were intended to do the same in New York. This is Sergeant Roscoe Archer. Um, He's a resident of Georgia. Um, he's in the Georgia National Guard, and he's taking a nap in one of Saddam Hussein's uh, palaces. And it's hard to imagine a more powerful and symbolic costume than the de desert, desert camouflage uniform worn by Sergeant Archer. His uniform separates and protects him from his surroundings. The importance of this symbolism is nicely summed up by Roberta Smith when she writes about the exhibition, Uniforms, Order, and Disorder. Could she be talking about architecture, the uniform that buildings wear? Quote, it is hard to think of any other man-made object, much less any other garment, that is as psychically charged, socially encoded, and historically emblematic as the uniform especially after a century that has seen as much violence and social unheaval as the one just passed. Uniforms have long defined tribes, nations, cults, and subcultures, divided good guys from bad. They tell us whom to obey, whom to fear or kill, whom to speak to or whom to ignore. They indicate whom to ask for directions or for the dinner check, or even who to ask out. Whoops. This is Villa Savoy. It's 75 years old. 
It wears a modernist costume, which is laden with as many messages as the blue polyester uniform worn by a Chicago cop. In both cases, there is uncertainty and ambiguity. Is he a good cop or bad cop? If we remember both the Wadsworth House, house um, if we remember back to the Wadsworth House, Villa Savoy is also a void in an outdoor room domina dominated by that most unsustainable of landscape features, the lawn. In turn, at the center of its blank white wall is the void of its horizontal strip window. Um, I think buildings can be considered in many ways, but thinking of them as an elaborate costume, I think, exposes their iconic power. This is my house. It stands at the corner of Ohio and Oakley Streets in Chicago on Chicago's west side. The neighborhood toughs gather on the corner on summer nights to drink a Corona or 10 or 20. My house on this corner needed a tougher uniform than Villa Savoy. Its context is not a lawn, uh, but an urban street. And the urban street accepts anything you can throw at it. It can live with a building which is unruly and disobedient. And certainly that's what I was trying to achieve here. Where the uniform of modernism is intended to be rational, the uniform worn by Ohio House is intentionally ambiguous. Two doors, one facing Ohio and the other facing Oakley, lead to the same place. In fact, one night a pizza man was delivering a pizza to our house and I saw him standing on the front porch and he didn't ring the doorbell. So I walked out, opened the door and said, are you looking for 2301 Ohio Street? And he said, yeah, but which one is, is it? And I said, well, both doors lead to the same place. He said, that can't be possible. So I actually brought him inside the house and demonstrated that in fact, both doors you went into led into the same house. So like Sergeant Ar Archer, um, uh, a building's uniform defines and separates it from its surroundings. Um, this is how the house is organized, by the way. The lower levels are the sort of piano noble where all the public rooms are, and then the upper levels are in inside the aluminum drum are where all the, the sort of bedrooms and workspaces are. The house's uniform disturbs its urban context, but does not damage the street, uh, not hardly. The urban street is challenging in its relentless alignment. It is dangerous in your face and absorbing all at the same time. And it's that vitality the street has which allows you the freedom to do what you really want to as an architect. This is um, a lithograph um, by an artist whose name is Roger Brown. It's called Cathedrals of Space. And actually, Roger Brown did this uh, well before the shuttle disaster. And here he pictures the space shuttle lifting off from its launching pad. The astronauts, which you can barely see in that, um, in that yellow window in the cockpit, are sort of waving to the crowds on the ground below. Um, and in my view, um, the, the, the space shuttle was an elaborate costume which the, which the astronauts wore into space. Um, and it was this notion uh, that a, a costume could really be a monumental object which drove the design um, of a project which we developed for a Chicago Architecture Foundation e exhibition called Invisible Cities. Um, and Invisible Cities was an attempt by the foundation to make visible the invisible impacts of the three major planning studies which were ongoing in the Chicago region at the time. Those planning studies were the Central Area Plan, the new zoning code for the city of Chicago, and uh, the Metropolis 2020 plan, which was a regional plan. Linda Searle and I, Linda Searle is my wife, by the way. She's also an architect. Um, uh, focused on Metropolis 2020, which is a classic regional policy, policy study, which has at its heart a fundamental notion about sustainability. If the location of housing and services and workplaces can be more intentionally organized, 
The region is more efficient, me measured monetar monetarily, and also in terms of con congestion, pollution, and energy. And as architects, we look for some place where this realignment could be made visible. By the way, this, uh, okay, this illustration shows in the, this brown color where job growth is expected in Chicago. And thi these orange pockets indicate where housing growth is being developed. And the mismatch between these locations is really the story of sprawl, the story of congestion, the story of o overloaded uh, freeways. And this is just one of a number of illustrations that are used to sort of populate Metropolis 2020. But as I said, we were looking for uh, a part of the landscape that we could repair based on the principles of Metropolis 2020. And the place we found was the Berkeley, Illinois rail yard. And until we found it, we never as, uh, as long-term Chicagoans knew there was even a suburb in Chicago called Berkeley. Um, it's a strange place. It's a huge uh, tract of land uh, it has a rail, uh, a metro stop on it. Metro is our interurban railway. It has two huge freeways going by it. Those are actually two different freeways, which you see off to the left-hand side of the screen. One is 290, the other is 294. Um, and then by virtue of its size, it interrupts Wolf Road, which is uh, right here, which is one of the major arterial streets, and it doesn't make it through the rail yard. Um, and none of the transportation modes interconnect with one another. So here's a view from the Mannheim uh, Road Bridge looking over that rail yard, which goes on for as far as the eye can see. And in a way, you know, the iconic Chicago images of the loop and the lakefront uh, are really the exceptions in Chicago. In fact, most of Chicago is a vast anonymous landscape, either industrial or residential. This is the Berkeley Metro stop, which has one of the smallest riderships of any station in the system. It is a wasted resource. The train stops here on any given morning to pick up a couple of passengers, while at the next stop in Elmhurst, it picks up a few hundred. Our objective was to repair and interconnect the different transportation networks. These traffic improvements would bring people to a one square mile zone covered with a huge polycarbonate sheet. The sun's energy is trapped under this roof by the greenhouse effect. And this is a view of the roof over the rail yard. The roof is shaped to channel the rising heat to a hollow 2,000 foot high HDTV broadcast tower containing wind turbines. Uh, the rising hot air would turn those turbines, uh, turbines generating uh, electric power to power the entire development. Uh, the solar tower would be anchored by an intermodal transportation hub, which would include major tech centers encouraging skilled labor from Chicago to make the reverse commute to this suburban location. Um, in fact, the tower and the canopy are an elaborate costume, like the space shuttle, whose fabric weaves a sustainable future into the work of repairing a damaged landscape. But most importantly, uh, this one development makes the entire region a more sustainable system. Now surprisingly, this is not the Berkeley rail yard. This is the rail yard in Cambridge, in East Cambridge, Massachusetts. And shortly after completing the CAF design, we were asked to design a, uh, develop, uh, 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 two um, residential towers for a developer that was redeveloping this rail yard. So I'm sort of sitting in my office getting the call to participate in this invited competition, and I'm going like, am I going to become a specialist in rail yards? Um, the site, as I said, was an old abandoned rail yard, sort of one of those anonymous industrial landscapes which remain un unmarked and unremarkable in our urban areas. We were assigned two adjacent parcels um, uh, based on the competition brief to design two residential towers. And the two parcels we were assigned were S and T. And the main street in the area is East Cambridge Avenue, which runs right along here. 
And the idea of the design, which was sort of a new urbanist scheme, was to promote movement from East Cambridge up into this sort of central park, which you see up here. Um, the developers envisioned a sort of a civilized new urbanist community, um, you know, where you could buy cappuccino and Chardonnay, sort of based on the best principles of sustainable design. But in fact, they only controlled a part of the landscape. And a good portion of the rail yard um, and the surrounding freeways and road networks would remain. Um, so, you know, we thought the image was uh, 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 interesting, but that the project really demanded a more muscular response than what you'd get from the normal new urbanist uh, mentality. Um, we walked the neighborhood. We walked to the other side of Cambridge Avenue. And there we found a surprising mix of unconventional architectural visions. Um, Boston is considered a brick town, but we found very little brick. Instead, we found uh, a variety of different, uh, very thin, very ephemeral skinning techniques, such as traditional wood siding, vinyl siding, asphalt shingles, uh, Every, everything you could think of in the way of a, of a, of a thin skin building and very little that was brick. So we asked ourselves, you know, could that be the basis of the design? And we found this apartment house, which you see at the center of the screen, which has this weird asphalt shingle pattern. And we envisioned reproducing that pattern in recycled uh, aluminum panels, which is the pattern you see on the left. And then we said, in the best sense of sustainability, well, let's combine recycled aluminum with reused aluminum. So, you know, you'd find a, sort of the old door to a DeLorean, and you'd sort of incorporate it in the facade of the building. And the resulting pattern for the building um, gave us the sort of view or the impression that we really were trying to achieve, which was a building that was camouflaged, that had a skin that was like Sergeant Archer's uniform. It, it, sort, of, it sort of camouflaged, it, it protected the, the occupants from this very aggressive environment. Um, the, one of the key elements uh, as the design developed was this thought of a green roof. And green roofs have become very common these days in the sense that every building you have you put a green roof on and that makes your project sustainable. But we wanted to activate the green roof by really making it um, sort of a second imagined idealized landscape that had its own um, set of buildings sort of perched eight stories up in the air. Um, and so we, we started looking at um, you know, how we might evolve that, that design um, and the design developed around this notion of a camouflage skin. It developed around the green roof. And it also developed around a pattern of, of the apartments, which you see in this image, where the green uh, shaded units are the larger two and three bedroom units. The yellow shaded units are the smaller one bedroom units. And the difference in size allowed us to modulate the exterior to create the towers, which you see in the uh, plan as it developed. So located up eight stories of, uh, from the surrounding streets was our green roof, which really was a sanctuary. Um, the uh, building included a series of towers up on that upper level. And those towers, each tower contained a cistern for storing rainwater. Um, the sort of football-shaped objects, which you see in these models, are the public rooms, which are suspended from those upper towers and sort of hover above that green level. This is an overhead shot looking down at the buildings. Uh, they're developed in a rather classic donut pattern. Um, and then uh, they lead to a, um, um, leading to the various uh, public areas. Uh, this is another view of the sort of green roof um, and some of the occupied spaces. So the building really integrates three different technologies. Uh, one is geothermal.
Standard Oil actually demolished all of these classic modernist stations and replaced them with, with stations that sort of looked like a McDonald's with a mansard look. But one of the paintings that Ruscha did uh, was called the Burning Gas Station, uh, which, was com which was painted in 1965. And as you can see, well, the gas station was burning. And in the con conflagration, as many people have observed, this, the word standard is burning. Uh, and so the commonplace is being destroyed, elevating the standard to something special. So as we ventured into the suburbia, our intent was to destroy the standard and the expected. And we have done this by accept, accepting the standard component, components of, that we find out in the hinterlands. Grass, asphalt, glass, brick, and aluminum. And then we've used them in very non-standard ways. This is, in our view, modern mannerism. And similar to the manner, mannerists of the 16th century, the expected meaning is discarded and replaced by, well, and it's hard, nothing. Here again, the missing narrative reinforces the one thing that is certain, and that is uncertainty. The Lager building is an anonymous flo uh, box floating above the same suburban landscape that you find everywhere of grass and asphalt. The company, Lipson Elkworth Glass Associates, Lager for short, is one of, the lead, one of the leading package design firms in the U.S. In fact, every time you pick up a Diet Coke can, that's one of their designs. And they were really a fascinating client to work with because they got the idea that the costume uh, was really a fascinating aspect of, of architecture, or thinking of architecture in that way. So we have the dark horizontal box which floats above the landscape. But in fact, there really are the building is composed of two boxes, a glass one, which is underneath the brick one, which is offset uh, from the other box by 50 feet, creating the dramatic cantilever, which seems so reminiscent of Ed Ruscha's paintings. Um, the lower glass box, though, is angled um, uh, to create a, um, uh, a large design studio, which is which is terraced up, and it's part of the, their culture that they like to exchange ideas. And so the terracing of the design studio was an important aspect of the design. That terracing begins in the lobby. It was quite interesting to explain to the client that we actually wanted to slope the floor of the lobby. The client, after a great amount of soul searching, decided that that, in fact, was a, a reasonable idea. This is the design studio, which you see in the lower right. Um, so, uh, Laga is composed of standard materials, yet it destroys the standard by composing these materials in unexpected ways. Uh, it is, in our mind, a rear view mirror building. You pass it thinking it is ordinary and expected, and only after you've passed it, you look back to try to figure out what was really going on there. The Midwest headquarters of 3Com is fixed firmly between those two I iconic sur surfaces of the American suburb, which I've talked about, the lawn and its alter ego, the par parking lot. The meaning of both are the opposite of their intent. Mushat observes it from the New York Times that, quote, a space dedicated to harmony and independence can easily become a battleground. Is an overgrown lawn a protected form of free speech? How about Christmas ornaments on the lawn or a cross burning? In contrast, the parking lot intends to make the suburb more convenient in the city. But this convenience separates people from their cars, from their buildings, and from other people, becoming in instead a symbol of inconvenience. So the Midwest headquarters of, of 3Com basically picks a fight with this landscape. It is intended to be seen from the lawn, and also from the parking lot. The office and research areas are wrapped in a taut skin drawn across the south, east, and north elevations. If the composition of these facades appears ambiguous, it is with a purpose. The suburbs are filled with office buildings. Some appear vertical, while others appear horizontal. 
if imagine if all the imagine all the different meetings where the architects are sitting there presenting the building design to their clients, and the architect swears that the right answer for suburbia is a vertical orientation to the facade. And then, you know, down the street, another architect is standing there and saying the right answer is horizontal lines. So we pick all of the above. Uh, moving through this entry, Moving through this entry, uh, the, the functions of the building are exposed in an interior street. And this interior street is really trying to set up the sense of a main street inside a large office building. And in a way, what we're doing is we're challenging all the assumptions of suburbia on the exterior, and on the interior, we, we're embracing all the convenience of a city. Uh, moving through this sort of major atrium, uh, all the major uh, uh, public functions are revealed. There's a sales center for the equipment of the company, a training center, an auditorium, a dining room. All of these are arrayed on either side of this major interior street. There's an espresso bar which overlooks the surrounding freeways. And then from this major artery, you lead to a, a grid of smaller pathways to the building, um, which lead you to the neighborhood centers, which are the conference centers spread throughout the building. So you encounter a, a near-perfect urban context on the interior based on a highly disciplined street grid and an architecture um, which um, is very understandable. But on the exterior, wherever you are, you encounter uh, a much more uncertain and ambiguous image um, where understanding isn't so clear, where the interior is straightforward and the narration uses an urban vocabulary. On the exterior, um, there, there is this ambiguity which exists between the, these two different notions. Um, where the exterior makes fun of the suburban sprawl, sprawl while the interior embraces a more sort of urban context. Um, our assignment to completely rebuild the Kresge Foundation headquarters um, rightly or wrongly uh, attempts to escape its context. Um, the site is a historic three-acre farmstead um, and the farmstead is on the National Registry of Historic Places. And with some small additions, this site served as the offices for the foundation for the past 20 years. Um, the site, uh, which is outlined in yellow, um, is in the middle uh, of a sea of lawns and parking lots in the sprawling community of Troy, Michigan. So you can imagine driving up to a historic farmstead and all you see as you're driving is parking lots, shopping centers, office buildings, and tract homes. So, and although the suburb is truly a product of English town planning, your average American thinks it is an extension of our agrarian past. past. Every suburban house is somehow a farmhouse. Every lawn is descended from a cash crop. And remembering Mushan's comments that the lawn is a battleground, that the 19th century farm is truly the true symbol of harmony and independence. It is an intrusion on the natural landscape, but it rested gently on the prairie. It was a business, but it was off the grid. It was self-contained. Uh, the technologies it used were sustainable, renewable, and largely free of pollution. These are the images of the Brooks Farm, farm which was the name of the farmer who built the development. Um, on the Kresge site. Um, in a near perfect contradiction, the foundation, when they first occupied the site, covered the entire proper, property with a perfectly green, heavily fertilized, and manicured lawn. In other words, for 20 years, the symbolism of the farm had really been mothballed by the foundation. Our strategy was twofold. First, repl replace the ambiguous iconography of the lawn by restoring, restoring the prairie as a new icon of sustainability. 
And second, embed the new building in this plane of natural grasses, uh, making it a part of the landscape. So this is the sort of site plan, uh, the upper level of the building. The green areas indicate green roof areas where we actually have let the prairie flow up and over the building. Uh, and these are the uh, plans. The lower level is actually our largest level. It's basically embedded in the landscape. It's sheltered, it's earth sheltered from the surrounding um, uh, environment. And then there is this sort of large central uh, uh, space defined by the new building on each side, which leads down to uh, a series of links which connect into the building. So here are uh, some images of the building. Um, the, this shows the juxtaposition of the new construction with the historic uh, buildings. Um, and these images show um, some of the restored prairie in the upper uh, left um, and the main employee entrance in the lower right. Uh, these are a series of the of, of interior images of the building. Um, uh, we expect that the building will be off the grid in terms of stormwater management. Uh, pervious paving is used throughout. Rainwater is stored using a cistern. Um, the garden walls, which you've seen in some of these images, are uh, gabions filled with all the demolished hard materials, all the concrete and asphalt that be kept on the site and used to create the garden walls. Um, geothermal energy is used to heat and cool the building. Uh, major portions of the exterior skin are earth sheltered. The skin is recycled uh, along with the steel structure of the building. Um, you know, all of the normal things that you would expect of a platinum rated building. So in a way, the way we look at it is the prairie is a dance floor. The 19th century buildings waltz around in their traditional co costumes, while the brand new structures uh, move to sort of a more different, more modern choreography. This is um, the site of uh, the Milwaukee Indian School, a K through eight multi-tribal school funded by casino money. The school held an invited competition for a new building which would include a community center. Uh, their site was a large tract of fallow farmland on which the prairie had more or less restored itself. Uh, and here we have an, uh, another one of Cindy Sherman's film stills, film still number 48. Um, man in the wilderness is an interesting thing for architects to co co uh, contemplate. Um, for most part, there's no real connection between our clients, the Indian community in Milwaukee in the past. They all came from an urban tradition. They were like Cindy Sherman, standing alone. The tension between road and form and single female was evident. Um, we really, in a way, tried to invent a past working with the community to figure out what the school would look like. Um, all it, it, although it was a multi-tribal school, all of the uh, tribes were from a group of Indians called the Eastern Woodland Indians. And we tried to identify what they pictured as their landscape. And actually, we, we hit on it with this sketch which I had made of the landscape of Lake Michigan um, up near Mackinac Island. And Everyone on the building committee agreed that this was their kind of vision of their homeland. The forest, rocky outcroppings, and water, whether it was a river or a lake, were sort of compositional elements. Um, so in developing the design, uh, we built on this idea that was, in, that was seen in the sketch. And we tried to do a building that, like the Kresge Foundation, was embedded in the landscape and rose up out of an expanded farmer's pond which existed on the site. Um, the design was built around the idea of, uh, of developing the classrooms 
as a series of fingers which sort of dive down into the pond. And then the public rooms interlocked with those fingers that, that dived into the water. Um, in this plan, uh, you can see the juxtaposition of the public rooms at the top and the classrooms in a series of fingers extending to the bottom of the drawing. And the way the schools evolve is that the largest population is the younger children. And then as the, the kids get older, they, a lot of them transition out to normal public schools. So, so as you move from young to old, you move from larger classroom functions to smaller classrooms from um, right to left on this drawing. Um, but the other thing we did is for the Indians, the rising and setting of the sun was also important. So we organized, this plan is organized around a sort of central circulation path, which is right here, which moves from the rising sun on the east to the setting sun on the west. Um, and that's also how the classrooms are organized. So you, you go from the younger students on the east to the older students on the west. Um, and this is that sort of main corridor which moves through the building. Um, the classroom areas have generous sort of uh, gathering spaces outside the classrooms where tutoring on an informal basis by adults can occur. And then the classrooms themselves are separated from these gathering areas by large uh, rotating panels which allow the classrooms to open up to this space. Um, another view of the exterior of the building. And this is the main entry where the bus drop-off is, um, which aligns directly with that main east-west corridor. So kids are dropped off in the morning. Um, they move in into the main, the main gathering space for the entire school, which also serves as the Cerberi dining room area. And then from there, um, they go th out through the building. Um, so in this case, we broke the rules. We actually offered the com Indian community a narrative for the building. We described the path through the building as being symb symbolic. Um, and so we invented a history and uh, history and mythology, which was something that they thought they needed and that they thought that their architecture could, uh, could provide. In fact, the juxtaposition between land and building is abstract, and our modern fascination for abstract lies in the delightful process of moving from the known and expected to the unknown and indeterminate. And this is the other thing, the underlying symbol that we were trying to realize in this project. Now, the last project I want to touch on is our work in Block 89 in Madison. Um, and these images sort of describe what happened in our project. And the thing that's so sort of funny about these images is, um, this is not a joke, this is like a real suburban residential developer who started out on a street where the, where the building pad and the street were at the same level. But as he went down the hill, the street died down and the building pad stayed up. And he just kept building his usual product until he got to, you know, this one down here, which imagine driving up that driveway to get in that garage. It's really insane. And, um, so with, with that as, this is an art, this is, this is life. Um, we began the redevelopment of Block 89 in Madison in 1995. Um, there were three significant structures on the block when we started. Um, there was a uh, J.C. Penney store right here, which had been renovated in a very unfortunate way by our developer about five or six years before we arrived on site. There was the historic insurance building, which was a seven-story small office building. And then there was the Burroughs Block, which is right here, which is one of the oldest buildings in Madison. It was a mercantile building. Um, and uh, those were the sort of three elements that we had to build into an 
urban design scheme which covered the entire block. Uh, Multi-use development, um, I know some of you are working on that in, this, in the year classes, but this was commercial, um, retail, and, uh, and parking. There was no residential in this development. So we accepted the three